Welcome to Wassa Community Church on Sunday morning. This camera here did not want to uh, work properly. So uh, I'm back here going through my sermon once again, just for those who may have missed it on Sunday. But uh, still the same sermon as Sunday. We're just back here. And on Sunday, we were in 2 Samuel chapter 19, and we were at verse 41. And what we're going to do is we're going to go all the way through chapter 20. So 2 Samuel 19 verse 41 through chapter 20, all the way to verse 26 where chapter 20 ends. So 2 Samuel, if you have your Bibles, 2 Samuel 19 41 to 20. 26. All right. Uh, so, yeah, we're still in 2 Samuel for possibly another month and a half or so. Uh, and in going through 2 Samuel lately, what we've seen is David's commander Joab in control of the narrative. And then we've seen him just last week lose control as David had Amasa, who was Absalom's commander during his rebellion, kept on as commander when David retook the throne, meaning Joab was demoted. Uh, so we see Joab in control, Joab loses that control, and today what we see is Joab taking control back. Also, this is one of those very violent stories, so just be prepared for that as we read through it. Quite violent. Uh, but with that said, let's read 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 41 all the way through to the end of chapter 20. Then all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, Why have our brothers, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king and his household over the Jordan and all David's men with him? All the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, Because the king is our close relative. Why then are you angry over this matter? Have we eaten at all at the king's expense? Or has he given us any gift? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah, We have ten shares in the king, and in David also we have more than you. Why then did you despise us? Were we not the first to speak of bringing back our king? But the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. Now, there happened to be there a worthless man whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjaminite. And he blew the trumpet and said, We have no portion in David, and we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So all the men of Israel withdrew from David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah followed their king steadfastly from the Jordan to Jerusalem. And David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten concubines whom he had left to care for the house, and put them in a house under guard, and provided for them, but did not go into them. So they were shut up until the day of their death, living as if in widowhood. Then the king said to Amasa, Call the men of Judah together to me within three days, and be here yourself. So Amasa went to summon Judah, but he delayed beyond the set time that it had been appointed him. And David said to Abishai, Now Sheba, the son of Bichri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he get himself to fortified cities and escape from us. And there went out after him Joab's men, and the Cherethites, and the Pelethites, and all the mighty men. They went out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. When they were at the great stone that is in Gibeon, Amasa came to meet them. Now Joab was wearing a soldier's garment, and over it was a belt with a sword in its sheath fastened on his thigh. And as he went forward, it fell out. And Joab said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him, but Amasa did not observe the sword that was in Joab's hand. So Joab struck him with it in the stomach and spilled his entrails to the ground without striking a second blow. And he died. 
Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. And one of Joab's young men took his stand by Amasa and said, Whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, let him follow Joab. And Amasa lay wallowing in his blood in the highway. And anyone who came by seeing him stopped. And when the man saw that all the people stopped, he carried Amasa out of the highway into the field and threw a garment over him. When he was taken out of the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. And Sheba passed through all the tribes of Israel to Abel of Beth Maka. And all the Bichrites assembled and followed him in. And all the men who were with Joab came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Maka. They cast up a mound against the city, and it stood against the rampart. And they were battering the wall to throw it down. Then a wise woman called from the city, Listen, listen, tell Joab, come here that I may speak with you. And he came near to her. And the woman said, Are you Joab? He answered, I am. And she said to him, Listen to the words of your servant. And he answered, I am listening. Then she said, They used to say in former times, let them but ask counsel at Abel. And so they settled a matter. I am one of those who are peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city that is a mother in Israel. Why will you swallow up the heritage of the Lord? Joab answered, Far be it from me, far be it that I should swallow up or destroy. That is not true. But a man of the hill country of Ephraim called Sheba, the son of Bichri, has lifted up his hand against King David. Give up him alone, and I will withdraw from the city. And the woman said to Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown to you over the wall. Then the woman went to all the people in her wisdom, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and threw it out to Joab. So he blew the trumpet, and they dispersed from the city, every man to his home. And Joab returned to Jerusalem to the king. Now Joab was in command of all the army of Israel. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was in command of the Cherethites and the Pelethites. And Adoram was in charge of forced labor. And Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was the recorder. And Shiva was secretary, and Zadok and Abiathar were priests, and Ira, the gyrate, was also David's priest. God, you're so good to us, and I thank you so much for that. And I just pray as I preach once again through this, um, I just pray that you would still once again be with me as I speak in the name of Jesus. And that, again, if I say, or have said even last time, anything that's wrong or anything that's untrue, I just pray that none of that would be believed, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray that none of that would be believed. But Lord, for those who are watching, I just pray that your truths would be understood, that they would be grasped, that they would be remembered, and that they would be believed in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would be at work in the hearts of the hearers and in my heart, in my heart again, as I go through the same message once again. Keep hitting me in the name of Jesus. But above all, be glorified, Lord. I pray this all in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. There was a time where I didn't like to go to church back in my teens back before I had a real grasp of the gospel and when I wasn't fully pursuing God my parents loving me they still brought me to church even though I wasn't always a big fan of it but I remember one day I just you know I just straight up refused to go and my parents informed me hey if you don't go to church today, you're going to lose your privileges. You're going to lose your privileges for today, which 
basically meant that I couldn't do anything fun that I would have wanted to, which back then would have been like, you know, playing video games or being on the TV. I still didn't budge. I still did not want to go. So I didn't. I stayed home. But I, I didn't just do nothing, right? I still wanted to play my games. I didn't want to go a whole day without them. So we have this, this really big table in our house that for a long time was just covered in, in loads and loads of papers. And, and living, living on my own now or with uh, Christina, I, <laughs> at my own place, I just, uh, I think, it's so easy for that to happen. I can see now like how that kind of thing happens where things just pile up and pile up. But that's, that's what was this table's issue, you know? Uh, that's what was going on, right? On this table, it was just full of all kinds of papers, piles and piles of papers. And, you know, I'm sure there was other things too, just stuff that was just piled up on that table, and for two hours, I sorted all those papers and cleaned up that entire table. And when my family got back home from church, they were actually very impressed, you know, and I got those privileges back. You know, I worked hard to make up for what I had done wrong, and I got out of my punishment. And today, we see something similar, similar, right? Not the same, but similar with Joab. Our passage in 2 Samuel once again begins with argument. The men of Judah and the men of the other tribes of Israel, they're arguing about who should have taken the king back over the Jordan after his time on the run. It's as if Judah is stealing the king that they were against when Absalom was around from the men of Israel who were the first to say, we should bring him back. We should bring back the king. However, Judah's words, they, they still prevail. And the king continues on to Jerusalem with the men of Judah. But someone, someone from one of those other tribes of Israel he is done with David. And at the start of chapter 20, we read, Now there happened to be a worthless man. The Bible calls him worthless. Named Sheba, whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjaminite. And he blew the trumpet and said, we have no portion in David, and we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So all the men of Israel withdrew from David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah followed their king steadfastly from the Jordan to Jerusalem. So this, this worthless man, Sheba, he, he kind of takes charge, telling the men of Israel to break away from David and to go each man to his own tent. And they listen. They all listen. I'm not sure how many of them really wanted to, but the rivalry between Judah and Israel, it was pretty big at this time. It was, it was at a, a big height. It was tall. I don't know. But it was big at this moment. So I don't think they were going to stick around when someone from one of their tribes had taken charge and called them away. When David is back in Jerusalem, he gives Amasa, his new commander, a command to gather the men of Judah to him within three days. But Amasa delays. Now, maybe he just couldn't get around fast enough. You know, I'm not sure if David being in a rush to go after Sheba gave him too little of a time frame to, to gather everyone, or if maybe Amasa wasn't taking his role as, you know, seriously as he could and was just taking his time. Either way, David then goes to the next guy, Joab's brother, Abishai, the one who 
always seems to want to uh, take vengeance into his own hands instead of, you know, leaving it to the Lord. David goes to Abishai, and let's look at verse 6. And David said to Abishai, Now Sheba, the son of Bichri, will do to us more harm than Absalom. So David really sees uh, this Sheba, this guy who's taken all these men of Israel away. He sees them as a huge threat. So David says, Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he get himself to fortified cities and escape from us. And there went out after him Joab's men and the Cherethites and the Pelethites and all the mighty men. They went out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. So here we have actually Joab back on the scene. Because when it says Joab's men, Joab was also there. Joab is back on the scene. Joab, who had just been demoted as commander in favor of Amasa. Joab, who may do a lot of good for David, but who does things his own way. Joab, who loves being in control and isn't afraid to get his hands dirty. He and his men are going after Sheba. And one thing that we've learned about Joab over the course of this book is that he is very good at getting his men, right? This is a man of war, one of the most skilled men of war. And so him and his men going after Sheba, well, that's very bad news for Sheba. <laughs> but first, we come across the delayer. We come across Amasa. Verse 8, when they were at the great stone that is in Gibeon, Amasa came to meet them. Now, Joab was wearing a soldier's garment, and I'm not sure if this differed from a commander's garment back in that day, but it seems to me like he's dressed, you know, just like one of the army guys, just like a soldier. Not necessarily a commander, but just like a soldier. And over it, over that soldier's garment, was a belt with a sword in its sheath fastened on his thigh. And as he went forward, it fell out. Now, did it fall out and get caught in the garment, perhaps concealing it a little better from the view of a massa? Or did it actually just fall on the ground? Maybe Joab had a second sword. Maybe he had two. We're not sure. But what seems most likely is that Joab's sword did fall on the ground and he picked it up with his left hand, which is not an attacking hand. And sometimes I also wonder, like, uh, if Joab, you know, maybe purposely caused that sword to fall out and pick it up with his, light, with his left hand in a way that would not alarm Amasa. You know, if Amasa saw an unsheathed sword in Joab's right hand, I'm sure he would be a lot more on guard. But the sword was in Joab's left hand, so he didn't really pay much attention to it, if he did see it at all. Now, we know the sword was in Joab's left hand because of what was said next. And Joab said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. So there you go. The right hand has the beard to greet Amasa, you know, with a kiss. Therefore, the sword would be in Joab's left hand. But Amasa, it says, Amasa did not observe the sword that was in Joab's hand. He wasn't on guard. He wasn't paying attention. So Joab struck him in the stomach with it and spilled his entrails to the ground without striking a second blow. And he died. Amasa died. And right away, Joab and Abishai are off again to go after Sheba. Just right away. Amasa dies a very gruesome death. Joab, a good 
commander from a military standpoint, from a moral standpoint, maybe not, is still that murderer that he was when he and Abishai took the life of Abner back in chapter 3, and when he and 10 of his men took the life of Absalom back in chapter 18. And I shouldn't even say, you know, maybe not. Like, is he a good commander from a moral standpoint? No, like he's not. He's not. We see again Joab, the murderer. After Amasa was taken off the highway and a garment was laid over him to cover his body, the rest of the people also went after Sheba, following in Joab and Abishai's footsteps. And they all came to a place called Abel of Beth Maka, where Sheba was, and they besieged it. It says in verse 15 that all the men who were with Joab came and besieged him, so besieged Sheba in Abel of Beth Maka. They cast up a mound against the city, and it stood against the rampart, and they were battering the wall to throw it down. They were ready to just lay this place to waste. But, as it says, then a wise woman called from the city. Listen, listen, tell Joab, come here that I may speak with you. And he came to her and the woman said, are you Joab? He answered, I am. And she said to him, listen to the words of your servant. And he answered, I am listening. Then she said, they used to say in former times, let them but ask counsel at Abel. And so they settle the matter. I am one of those who are peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city that is a mother in Israel. Why will you swallow up the heritage of the Lord? So this was a very historical, important place in Israel at that time. But Joab, he's not as concerned about destroying the city. That's not what's on his mind. He wants Sheba. Joab answered, far be it from me, far be it that I should swallow up or destroy. That is not true. But a man of the hill country of Ephraim called Sheba, the son of Bichri, has lifted up his hand against King David. Give up him alone and I will withdraw from the city. And the woman said to Joab, behold, his head shall be thrown to you over the wall. Then the woman went to all the people in her wisdom. And so she, can, she convinces them. I don't know if they needed very much convincing, because I'm sure Joab's army was frightening. But she convinces them to give up Sheba and to do what she says. Cut off his head, throw it over. And they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and threw it out to Joab. So he blew the trumpet, and they dispersed from the city, every man to his home. And Joab returned to Jerusalem to the king. So Joab has taken care of the problem, the, the rebel, that is Sheba. Or I should say that was Sheba. And because Amasa is already out of the way, and Joab is still proving that he can get the job done, the very next verse, verse 23 gives us this update. Now, Joab was in command of all the army of Israel. He is back in control of the army. He is back in the role of commander. It seems like his killing of Amasa was overlooked because even though he had gone against the will of the king by killing the king's new commander Amasa, he made up for it by accomplishing the will of the king in squashing Sheba's rebellion. And so what was taken from him was returned. At the end of this chapter, he is back in the lead. He is back as commander of Israel's army. Joab is back in command. He worked hard to make up for the sin he had committed. He worked, he worked hard to make up for the sin he had committed. But I'm here, I'm here to tell you today, 
what seems to work here for King David does not work for God. And, and sure, we look at Joab, you know, he's a murderer. Murder is a big one. But even if we think of me and being disobedient to my parents, that's a small thing, right? Surely, in the eyes of God, I can make up for that. But the answer is no. The answer is no. I cannot make up for my sin. God is not like us humans. If someone wrongs us in just, you know, a little way like that, if someone wrongs us in a little way, usually there is room for them to make up for their sin or make up for what they've done against us if they're really sorry and, and if they work hard. But for God, no matter how much we work to make up for our sins, we're never going to find forgiveness. No matter how good we are, it's not ever going to be enough for us to escape punishment. On our own, we are trapped and there is no escape. Joab, Joab may be back in command, but down the road, in the book of Kings, Another son of David tries to take the throne. His name is Adonijah. And this time, Joab backs him. He no longer sides with David. Again, he's just doing what he wants. And when the threat of Adonijah is squashed, and David's other son, Solomon, is anointed king, and David is giving some final words to Solomon before he himself dies, before David dies, David remembers everything. Joab is not scot-free. What he did did not actually quite make up for his sins. This is what it says. You also know what Joab the son of Zeruiah did to me. How he dealt with the two commanders of the armies of Israel, Abner, son of Ner, and Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed, avenging in time of peace for blood that had been shed in war, and putting the blood of war on the belt around his waist and on the sandals of his feet. Act therefore according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray head go down to Sheol in peace. Those are David's words to Solomon. Joab's punishment is going to catch up to him. And after David's passing, and after Solomon puts Adonijah himself to death, this is Joab's end. When the news came to Joab, for Joab had supported Adonijah, although he had not supported Absalom, Joab fled to the tent of the Lord and caught hold of the horns of the altar. And when it was told King Solomon, Joab has fled to the tent of the Lord and behold, he's beside the altar. Solomon sent Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, saying, go strike him down. So Benaiah came to the tent of the Lord and said to him, the king commands, come out. But he said, no, I will die here. Then Benaiah brought the king word again, saying, Thus says Joab, or thus said Joab, and thus he answered me. The king replied to him, Do as he has said, strike him down and bury him, and thus take away from me and from my father's house the guilt for the blood that Joab shed without cause. The Lord will bring back his bloody deeds on his own head, because without the knowledge of my father David, he attacked and killed with the sword two men more righteous and better than himself. Abner the son of Ner, commander of the army of Israel, and Amasa the son of Jether, commander of the army of Judah. So shall their blood come back on the head of Joab and on the head of his descendants forever. But for David... And for his descendants, and for his house, and for his throne, there shall be peace from the Lord forevermore. Then, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, went up and struck him down and put him to death. 
Not really the way that you'd think Joab, the man of war, would, would go out, but uh, that's how it was. His sin does catch up with him. His sin does lead to his death. He is slain at the altar for his own sin. It's interesting too because at the end of our passage today, in verse 23, we see these two next to each other. It says, Now Joab was in command of the army of Israel, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was in command of the Cherethites and the Pelethites. They're right next to each other, and, and guess who Solomon makes commander in Joab's place? Benaiah. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. The one right beside him at the end of this 2 Samuel 20 chapter. The one right beside him. He will end up being his end. Slaying him at the altar for his sin. And taking his place. If all we had to look at was this 2 Samuel 20 chapter. We'd simply see that Joab makes up for his own sin. But looking at the big picture... Not even he can make up for it. The only thing we can do that can make up for our sin in the eyes of God is die. Bulls and goats, they do a part. They do their part at the altar, but they won't keep us from our punishment forever. They can only atone for so much. So eventually we'll find ourselves at the altar too. Dying like Joab for our sin. If, if we keep living like him, doing whatever we want, doing whatever we think is best, living according to our sinful flesh, living according to the power, the prince of the power of the air, following the course of of this world. We'll be there too. If that's how we go. It says in Hebrews 10 verse 4. For it is impossible. For the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That's what they used to do. Sacrifice the animal. A ram. A goat. A bull. Sacrifice that animal. And sprinkle its blood on the altar to atone for the sins of the people. The death of a spotless animal instead of the death of a sinful human. But that wasn't a good enough solution. That still was not enough because these animals had to be offered repeatedly. But a solution was coming. A true Solution, Not a solution from earth where the tabernacle, the tent, and the altar were just man-made copies of what was in heaven. No, but this solution would be from heaven. An offering for the heavenly tent and altar. So let's look again at Hebrews 10 verse 4. And then we'll keep reading. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ, Christ Jesus, came into the world, when he came into the world, this is what he said. Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Those are the bulls and the goats. Those are their sacrifices. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book, as it is written of me in the scriptures. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he said, or then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. 
And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Not repeatedly, like those animals, once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, a single offering, just one, he has perfected perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And those who are being sanctified are those who have, with repentant hearts, placed their faith, their, their belief in Christ Jesus and in His death and resurrection, turning from just going their own way like Joab, following their own path, and instead choosing to commit their lives to Jesus in faith. And who are now in the process of becoming more holy. And growing to be more and more like Jesus on their way to heaven. If you've done that, if you've placed your faith in Christ, that sacrifice of this heavenly being that was offered once for all sin will perfect you for all time. For all time. Absolutely. You're going to be allowed into heaven after you die. You've received eternal life. You could never have made up for your own sin as a sinner. You needed that perfect heavenly one to make up for it for you. And he did that, living perfectly, and then was slain on the cross like a lamb at the altar, taking the punishment that you deserved. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and the mind, the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works. So that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand. That we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. His workmanship. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful to God. That the Lord finally made all of this click in my mind that I'm saved by grace through faith, not by works, not by works. Back before I had a real grasp of the gospel and I wasn't fully pursuing God, I was on the same path as Joab, trying to make up for my sins on my own. Praise God I'm not doing that anymore. And praise God that our works are not the way to heaven because we never make it. We'd absolutely never make it. Praise God that our salvation depends instead on the work of the perfect, heavenly Jesus and on our faith in Him and His work. 
that he upholds. Bow with me in prayer. Lord, you are wonderful. You are amazing. And to say that so many times, I almost feel like sometimes I, I repeat that and say that so often without really thinking about how amazing or good you are. Because those words are true. But how often when I say them, am I really in awe of you? Help me to be more in awe of you. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you so much that if our faith is in you, you've made us those who are being sanctified, those who are growing to be more and more like you on our way to being perfect after we die. That you are sanctifying us. We don't want to miss the end of Ephesians 2. We don't want to miss verse 10, which says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We don't want to miss that. We don't want to totally avoid works. We should be doing good works. We should be following you and serving you and listening to what you have to say in your word and obeying you and all those things. We do not want to miss verse 10 of Ephesians 2. We don't want to miss that. But at the same time, Lord, I thank you so, so, so much for verses 8 and 9. That even though we should be doing all those good works, that it doesn't depend on us. It doesn't depend on our works. It depends on your work, God. And if we've placed our faith in you, because of your work, God is gracious. God is gracious to us. Thank you so much, God. Thank you so much, God. Let us never forget about that. I know sometimes it's hard for us as Christians to remember things, and that's probably because we don't read enough of our, our Bibles or we don't preach the gospel to ourselves enough, but sometimes we forget and we think, oh, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to do this, and we build ourselves up in pride, like I've done so much works, but Lord, our works are still rags, filthy rags. Help us to trust in your work. Not to neglect good works, but to trust in your work. And to be confident in that. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I pray this all in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen.